Well, you are joining us for a teaser to the Property Investor Show, which is taking place at London Excel on the 1st and 2nd of April. And uh, today we're running a panel debate to highlight one of the debates that's going to be taking place at the show. And that debate is called How to Be Savvy at Due Diligence. And I'm joined by three lovely ladies who are going to share their views on this with me. I hasten to say we did have some gentlemen that we wanted to invite along, but they couldn't make it. So uh, it's a little bit like the Spice Girls of property today, isn't it? <laughs> so ladies, um, welcome to the debate. Uh, Louise, could I come to you first? Just give us a quick overview um, of your business. Yeah, so I've been um, an investor, a landlord, um, and latterly developer since 2007. Um, my first investment I actually made abroad in Poland, which some people would consider being quite high risk because a lot of people are averse to even investing beyond their doorstep. Um, so for me, you know, getting savvy and checking things out. So for me, due diligence is about checking and researching thoroughly before before leaping. And it's something that's very close to my heart because I am quite a risk averse investor. Um, so I carry out lots of due diligence before I invest, but also my business property venture, which I start in 2007. I help investors, particularly um, distance investors specializing in expats. I help them invest in UK property. So I help them with de-risking or using due diligence appropriately for their investments as well. I don't ever um, assume that I um, have done all of the due diligence on their behalf, but I, I, I go partway down that track, but also encourage them to uh, check things out for themselves as well. How about you, Patricia? You've got the money tree. <laughs> Property money tree, yes. So after working for decades, really, in, in, in law as a solicitor, I finally decided to do something that I'm really passionate about, and that was working in property. I absolutely love it. I'm passionate about it. I, I cannot tell you how much I enjoy working in property. And that is when Property Money Tree was birthed. Um, so I, but I first became a landlord in 1986, ages and ages and ages ago. And You don't look old enough. <laughs> Thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. And um, so through the years of my legal practice, I've been, you know, running my property business, but not very well because I had to rely on other people to do the management for me, to find things for me, to do the building works, to project manage and all of that. And I made so many mistakes with the choices that I made, with the people that I employed, all of those things. But when I started actually working for myself, I then just suddenly thought, if only there'd been someone there who could actually have told me the things that I now know, I'd have made oh, fewer mistakes. So I try and share my experiences with other people in a podcast, which is called Maximizing Property Values. And Louise has been on it. Um, and I just, I just, I just love sharing a, you know, my experiences with other people. Um, so I continue to be a landlord and, you know, buy things and develop them and, you know, just, just enjoy being in property. And that's me really. Fantastic. What about you, Hayley? And so I've been, uh, so I purchased my first property 20 years ago. I'm a bit of a due diligence freak, the same as you ladies. And I love the idea of us being the Spice Girls of property. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so great, great name for us. I think we should carry that through, Louise, when we uh, do the panel live. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I, I, I'm a portfolio landlord. I've been in the industry for a really long time. I absolutely love property. Um, it's the only constant in my life and uh, I constantly uh, uh, progress and, and, uh, and find something new all the time. No project is the same. I've done everything from buy to let's 50,000 pounds up to currently working on an 86 million pound site. So um, <laughs> there is and everything else in between. So um I set up Your Freedom Empire, which is a business and uh, property training organization, predominantly originally working with internationals investing in the UK property market, um, but then having a lot of UK people that would come to me as well and ask for you know, advice, mentorships, and uh, due diligence is one of the things I absolutely love doing and minimize the risk as much as possible with not only my own investments, but also anyone that's coming through our training as well. So that's kind of where it all started. 
but I don't think it will ever end. It's one of those things that I, 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 I genuinely love doing. Um, but yes, um, <laughs> it started accidental landlord really, and uh, as many of us probably did start out um, and uh, and just progress from there. Mm. Well, we're, we're having this panel debate uh, at, a, at a very interesting time in the property sector because we've um, had a number of market shocks, um, obviously Brexit, uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, um, you know, there are concerns that the uh, Russian-Ukraine war will uh, impact certainly on the economy and that's very much tagged to the property market. So. To my mind, risk has been amplified over the last, uh, I don't know, two or three years. And with due diligence, basically, it's just all about research, isn't it? It is, but also listening, I think, to your gut. Um, and I think, I think the more experience you get under your belt, I think the more your gut instinct can help guide and act as your barometer or steering wheel if you like um, there have been a number of times when I've just known something hasn't quite felt right and I've not wanted to move forwards with it until I've checked a, a few things out um, so yeah research is key but I think I think it's also you know using the Pareto 80-20 rule using your gut instinct to sort of guide where you focus your due diligence because otherwise you could be spending days and days, weeks and months just doing desk research and not getting very far. So I, I think it's very much about prioritising and targeting the areas that you want to focus in a bit more on in terms of doing due diligence. Mm -hmm. I think uh, all of you, when you were introducing yourselves, um, you all said that, you know, you provide some due diligence for your, your clients, but you want them to uh, take responsibility for it. And I, I think that's such a massively important thing. I always say if I, uh, you know, recommended an investment to my mum, I wouldn't want her to take my word for it. I would want her to do her own due diligence. And Hayley, it, it came across to me that you felt very strongly that, that you know, if people undertake their own due diligence and they're trained how to do it, they're standing in a position of responsibility for their own actions. And, and that's a very empowered place to stand, isn't it? I think a lot of people focus on numbers and not necessarily, you know, research um, that side of the due diligence. And they don't necessarily look at due diligence in its full form either. And I find that a lot of um, investors that are coming through, um, and certainly me when I first started out as well, um, they would miss a lot of the key elements, you know, such as the 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 world we are living in uh, as we find ourselves today you know Vanessa with Russia and COVID and and all things like that and um you know th this is it's not new really is it you know there's always something that's happening so I think a lot of people will just focus on what's right in front of them and on that investment strategy and perhaps that single deal rather than the overall picture and we are looking at micro and macro markets we're looking at what is going on in the world you know right now um it, from um a development point of view materials have shot up mm -hmm. you know 35 percent over the last 18 months which is something that we have to absorb as professionals and not necessarily something that we could have forecasted either you know um we can watch what's happening um but we can't say exactly okay, we need to factor in 35% for increase in materials, for example. Um, so what we have to do is approach our investments as professionals, which is what we all do on this panel. We have to obviously look at creating buffer. We have to make sure the research stacks up. We have to make sure that we understand the area of investment we're going into, the strategy, our competition, and how that can be affected by outside um, events that we cannot control. And I think that's what we do really well. Fantastic. Well, Patricia, I think it's interesting because when we talk about due diligence in property, we, we the, the most I hear it talked about is uh, when you're analysing deals, which, of course, you do need to do intense due diligence. But actually, you need to be doing due diligence throughout the entire landlord life cycle, wherever there's any kind of commercial transaction. So that could be uh, you know, you need to do due diligence um, on maybe a property training company if you're thinking of working with them on a deal sourcer. 
on a letting agent that you might want to work with, and of course on a tenant that you might want to rent to, you actually need to do it in, in any aspect of commercial transaction throughout the property life cycle. So it's very important for people to understand that this is just a continual ongoing process all the time. I could not agree with you more. You know, we are there to make money and we can make money also by not losing money. And I think a lot of people don't actually tend to look at that side of things. People just think about, you know, if I buy this for this amount of money, then I can make this amount of money. But it's also very important to actually plug the losses. And that is where due diligence really, really, really helps. Because if you do the research, you're not going to be hopefully losing too much money you know I've lost lots of money because I just didn't have the time to do the due diligence I didn't have the time to look into the people that I was employing that I was doing business with and that is one thing that I stress to the people that I mentor now I guess it does sound a bit boring because for instance when I when I when I start to buy from someone I will research them to death and then once I know that I trust them I'm their loyal customer for a long, long time, because I know that they've ticked all of those boxes. You know, so initially, it's a lot of hard work. But once you put the work in, then you can start to reap the rewards. Throughout the transaction of being a landlord, we need to be doing our due diligence all the time. And there are so many public access resources that, that we can use to do due diligence. So we've got Companies House, Endelay, we've got software that does due diligence. You can ask on forums, have you heard of this person? What are they like to work with, etc. So there is actually no excuse not to do <laughs> due diligence, in my opinion. You've got so many resources out there that you can dive into. And I think one thing I like to stress about due diligence is nobody should take it personally. Yeah. If you're an ethical, transparent business, I think you would welcome people undertaking due diligence on you because you've got nothing to hide. It differentiates you uh, from your competition. And I, I do recall many years ago um, when there was a property trainer making some big claims about his personal wealth. I asked a very simple question. What's the name of your limited company? And he just went absolutely ballistic and started this verbal diatribe against me for asking and that to me was an immediate red flag because I could I could go and find out myself on on company's house I just asked him a simple question and that was his response and you know anybody uh that is ethical and transparent well they're not going to have a problem Louise are they if, if you want to ask questions of them yeah no absolutely and I I've had something similar just via LinkedIn in fact because I, I I think the um we've got so much at our fingertips as you say in terms of desk research sources we can use and social media so in some respects we feel as though we know some people more than we actually do because we've connected with them online and virtually but we may not have necessarily met them in person um, and there was um, a chap who was on there um, in a different country who was offering his services for um, offering real estate. And I remember having a conversation going backwards and forwards. And I had a very similar reaction, Vanessa, because um, there were some things that he was saying that I found a bit puzzling. And then I asked um, a question um, again about um, his, his his company and um, he just went off on one and it just just made me realize um, that actually he was being too defensive really um, and it, it, it did sort of create an element of doubt in my mind and for me the people side of due diligence and de-risking investing is so underrated when you're a distance investor, it becomes that much more important to know who you're dealing with and to be able to know how much you can trust them because you're not necessarily always there with your feet on the ground and your eyes on the ground. So you've got to know that the people who you are dealing with are, are, are worthy of your custom. Um, and uh, I mean, you've mentioned agents, you mentioned um, other people in, in the, there's so many people involved in the property investment process that it just takes one bad apple um, and it can really upset the apple cart. And yeah. so um, I, I think we do have to take care not to be lulled into a full sense of security by this virtual world we're in. Mm -hmm. There is still so much to be said for really um, 
sounds a bit odd if I say scratch and sniff, but you know, you know, actually, <laughs> physically, is physically. that the name of our first single? <laughs> <laughs> we need to make up a dance for that now. <laughs> no, I, I, I totally uh, hear what you're saying, Louise. Um, I think, you know, we hear a lot about people relying on social proof. And obviously, since the advent of the social web, social proof has become much more uh, much more of a factor in people's decisions, perhaps wrongly so, because um, a lot of it can be manufactured. Uh, you know, we've got Trustpilot under scrutiny now um, because of the amount of fake uh, and incentivized reviews. Uh, you know, we've had the uh, collapse of the JVIP group earlier, uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, a lot of people saying, well, I was introduced by a trusted mentor or a trusted friend. Um, there is this element of social proof which which can mislead people. And it, it just really goes back to what I was saying about don't take anybody's you know, word for anything, you must uh, undertake the, the work yourself. And if you're not sure how to, um, then ask for help. There's plenty of help out there. I mean, um, Hayley, what, what would you say uh, would be your kind of top due diligence tip? We actually vet all of the teams that we work with. So um, from that point of view, um, we make sure that everybody is fully compliant, etc. They're registered with the correct bodies. They've got a complaints procedure, all things like that. Um, Those are very, back, very good points. Thank you. Because so often we see companies that don't have their company number on their website, which is a legal requirement. They don't have uh, membership of the appropriate professional bodies. That's a, another red flag. These are all little things that, that can point the way to whether a company's you know acting in a professional manner aren't they I think the best thing about due diligence is it's such a wide you know it can mean so many different things so as you said it's not only about the deal and in fact it's less about the deal and more about the people you're working with the areas you're investing in your exit strategies your lending capability straight through to project management and taking that investment through to fruition so it is a full ongoing and it doesn't end you know if you sell that property okay perhaps it ends and then you start again Game, but you become a landlord, you're vetting, of course, your lettings agencies, and then you're monitoring and maintaining that portfolio as well. You know, this idea of passive is it's never truly passive. <laughs> There's ongoing re research. It doesn't end. I think certainly for newbies coming into the scene, newcomer landlords and investors, you know, I, I, I'm sure you'd agree, Patricia, they, they actually should prioritise um, understanding how to do due diligence, learn all the resources out there um, and make sure that they've got everything at their fingertips to mitigate their risk as they start out on their on their property investor journey. In the, the mentorship contract that I have, there is a clause there which says every business decision will be that of the mentees because they need to take responsibility for what they're doing. I am there to guide. Well, we will be putting a link to the uh, show registration under this video. It is free to attend. And whenever you go to any event or uh, any meeting, or as we said, if you're engaged in any commercial transaction, do do your due diligence. Do not assume that somebody else has done it for you um, because it's your risk and you have to understand whether you're willing to, to take that risk if you identify a risk. So Louise, when, when is your panel debate? It's on Friday, oddly enough, the 1st of April. Um, <laughs> no joke. This is, this is a serious panel debate and you really do want to be there. Uh, it's in the afternoon. Um, I think it's three o'clock that it was scheduled in. But anyway, on that Friday, the 1st in the afternoon, do, do come and uh, find us. We're in one of the rooms upstairs, I think. So I think it's going to be a really great um, debate and also the audience will have the chance to put their questions to the panel so it's we've got lots of things to share I've got lots of questions to ask um, Patricia and Hayley and, and, and share my own experiences as well but it's also the opportunity for the audience to ask a question if they you know they don't know how to go about something or they've got a burning burning desire to find out something so it'll be a great interaction. 
Well, that's what I love about debates because they they just tease out the issues. That's why they're so powerful. <laughs> they're such a great thing for the community. So um, thank you ladies for joining me uh, on this first debate for the Property Investor Show. As I said, it's a little preview for the event, uh, which is taking place at London Excel on the 1st and 2nd of April. Um, and go and join these ladies in their due diligence debate and uh, become even savvier at undertaking the due diligence process. And as I said, I'll put the link to free tickets underneath the video. So thank you to my lovely guests and I wish you a very successful panel debate on the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Vanessa. you. Thank you.